say money won't make you happy, but everybody want to find out for themselves. <laughs> Friend of mine, Rita Davenport said money ain't important, but it's right up there with oxygen. <laughs> And let me tell you something, fellas, even if you're as homeless as I am, you got some money. Women will find something cute on you. <laughs> oh, he's got earlobes like Tom Cruise. <laughs> I used to be so broke, I'd walk past the bank and trip the alarm. <laughs> Creditors would call the house of my children would answer the phone and say, my daddy said he ain't home. <laughs> and sometimes they would catch me and say, hey, may I speak to Les Brown, please? And I said, sorry, but he's not here. You sound like Les Brown. Don't you go there, big boy. <laughs> oh, my God. This thing called life. It's fascinating. So anyhow, I want to share with you, this is not anything I read. This is why I have lived and what I've learned and, and how the, the way in which you can access your greatness. And what I realize is that information won't do it. Information won't do it. Because people can go online and get information. I was training and talking to one of my speakers the other day, and he had a speech that was heavy in content. And he ran through it, and I said, listen, what is your goal? He said, I want to change people's lives. I said, then, you don't need that right now. He said, what do you mean? I said, if information could change people, they can go online and get that. They go to the library and get that. If information could change people, everybody would be skinny, rich, and happy. Yeah. <laughs> All right? And so you look at that 2% that Gene talks about, and I'm a member of that 2%. I'm going to tell you how I got there, and I didn't know any of the stuff and any of the players that he talked about. I didn't know any of that. But I discovered a way, and now I'm teaching people how to do it in a fraction of the time. But what really amazed me, what I love about Gene is, he's one of the few speakers that I've seen speaking and he's not speaking from a theory. He's not speaking to a particular niche but he's speaking to the planet from a place of knowing. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are a lot of people out here doing what you're doing, Gene, but the but reason I have high respect for you, because you have accomplished something. Let's give him a tremendous, am I making sense on that? Yeah. And I admire your research and your study that you're a student of success. You're studying this, you're learning Still, even though you are still accomplished. And, and something that, that you just said, Greg, and I take a lot of notes, you said that, that truth is, is, is something that expires really as a result of awareness. That as we become more aware, what is the truth today is not a truth tomorrow. Does that make sense? Yes. yes, and so here's what I want you to do. Shake someone's hand on your right and left, look them in the eyes and say, you have something special, you've got greatness within you. Do that right now. You got greatness within you. Thank you. I love you, brother. I love you. Yes. You got something special. You got greatness. You got fantastic. Very good. How many speakers are in the room? Raise your hand. Speakers. Oh, fantastic. You're going to love this. I'm going to show you. I'm going to share it, kids. Okay, if I share some techniques and strategies with you. Yes. Okay. How many trainers in the room? Raise your hands, please. How many coaches in the room? Life coaches. Fantastic. Okay, I'm, I'm going to show you and teach you and take you behind the curtain of some secrets that I've discovered from the University of Hob Knox uh, that will allow you, and write this down, that will allow you to impact people's minds. Take notes. Yes. <laughs> impact people's minds, touch their hearts, and ignite their spirit. I'm going to show you how to do that in the, in the time that I have. How to impact people's minds, how to touch their hearts, and how to ignite their spirits. Because when people hear you at the end of a presentation, end of coaching, if we don't transform people's minds, be ye not conformed to this world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why is it my favorite book says that? Because we live in a world where we're told more about our limitations rather than our potential. Am I correct on that? Okay, how many of you have been told that you couldn't do something? Raise your hands, please. Okay, very good. So we got to overcome that conversation, that script that we've been born into. The next thing is that is very, very important, and this is as, as, as speakers, as trainers, as life coaches that we have to do, and what Secret Knock does is 
create a thirst. That you heard it say, you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. However, if you know how to strategically and experientially communicate, you can create a thirst where they want to drink. The biggest challenge and opportunity that we have right now is to create a thirst within people to expand their capacity and their skill set. Write that down. To create a thirst, because we can't do that for them. To, to create a thirst within people as a result of hearing us, their mindset has been transformed, and now there's a thirst, there's a hunger to expand their capacity and their skill set. There's no shortage of opportunity, there's a shortage of mindset and skill set. There are over two million jobs in this country that people cannot take advantage of because of the fact they don't have the skill set. We're going through creative destruction. When I was a kid, I used to work in a bowling alley. They knocked the bowls down, the balls down, the pins down, and we would jump down and we would straighten the pins back up. Somebody created an electronic tray, and that destroyed our jobs. They used to work on an elevator. What floor, please? You got on an elevator. Somebody created an elevator that did not have to be operated manually, and that destroyed my job. When I was in school, girls used to say, hey, what do you want to be? I want to be a long-distance operator. When you made a long-distance call years ago, they had what we call long-distance operator. Am I correct? Yes. yes, and somebody created some technology that eliminated those jobs, millions of jobs. So we, now we're in it at an accelerated rate. Uh, Alvin Toft talked about it in the book called Future Shock. And so, so we're going through creative destruction. Things are being created and this destroying job. I don't care who's in the White House, nobody can stop that and it's going to happen at an accelerated rate. And what Secret Knock does is it allows you to stay ahead of the game and, and help people to stay ahead of the game, giving them the tools they need to have the mindset and the skill set to make it. And here's the next thing that's very important that, that Greg is a genius at. And here's the next step. Mindset transformation, skill set expansion. The next thing that's very important is that people have to create collaborative, achievement-driven relationships. Most relationships are socially driven. This, the secret mock knocks is about bringing people of greatness together, bringing people together who have talents, abilities, and skills, and knowledge, and visionaries, and leaders, and, and as a result of our coming together, that we're able to create collaborative, achievement-driven relationships that will allow us to reach our goals in a fraction of the time. Those three steps right there is what I'm up to with my life in the world. And I can tell you just based upon things that I've learned and things that I've done that it works in all of this that I'm saying right now, you already know it. So I want you to see a presentation right now. World-renowned speaker, entrepreneur, and best-selling author, Les Brown, rose from humble beginnings to become a leading broadcast and platform personality, recipient of an Emmy, and dubbed one of the world's top five speakers by Toastmasters International. His captivating delivery, incorporating humor, insights, and proven techniques teaches, inspires, and challenges his viewers to ultimate levels of achievement. I know something about you, even not knowing you, that you've got greatness within you. You have the ability to do things that you can't even begin to imagine. You have talents and skills in you that you haven't even begun to reach for yet. Maybe that's why Jim Rohn said, when the end comes for you, let it find you conquering a new mountain, not sliding down an old one. Maybe that's why Henry David Thoreau said, oh God, to reach the point of death, only to realize that you've never lived, only to realize that you've never scraped the surface of your potential. If you want to make your dream become reality, the people that are running at their dreams know that it's possible that you can live your dream, that it's necessary, that you're relentless, that you have a plan of action, that you are creative. The people that are running after their dream know they're going to have hard times. They keep on running because they're saying within themselves, I'm the one, I'm the one, no matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. The people that are running after their dreams are the people that are hungry. I'm going to run through this quickly and then I'm going to have you ask me some questions and now I'll give Signal for the chance to try. How many have major goals you want to achieve? Raise your hands, please. Very good. I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it in three areas. Number one, what's one personal goal that you'd like to achieve? One, one personal goal. Why don't you write that down? My first personal goal was to buy my mother a home. That was it. I'm adopted. Born in an abandoned building on a floor in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City. And Mrs. Mamie Brown adopted seven children. I was among them. She had a third grade education. I feel like Abraham Lincoln who said, all that I am and all that I ever hoped to be, I owe to my mother. 
I saw a sign once that God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. Mama worked on Miami Beach and she cleaned homes and, and she kept children. And we wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that she kept. And we ate the food left over from the families that she cooked for. These people very kind and generous. And they said, Mamie, whatever food is left over, you can pack it up and take it home to those children that you have adopted. How many have somebody special you'd like to do something for? Raise your hands, please. Very good. I want you to think about them. Next thing is, I want you to think about your financial f freedom number. What will that number be? What will that number be? That once you do that, once you write that final check, you'll be debt free. It's a wonderful feeling. I'm debt free. And it's a good feeling. It's a great feeling to be debt free, cancer free, and drama free. Yes. And whatever that number is that you thought about or you wrote down, multiply it a hundred times. Multiply it a hundred times. Let me show you how you can make that happen. Next thing is, I want you to think about your social contribution. We live in the greatest country in the world that gives us an opportunity to live a life of contribution. Horace Mann said we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind. Now that you've written it, I want you to say with me with power and conviction, let us say together, it's possible. It's possible. Say it again, it's possible. It's possible. You know, there have been some presentations about how to sell yourself. Let me talk to you about another sale that's the most important thing, as that sale is for you. Selling yourself that it's possible. Selling yourself that you have greatness within you. Selling yourself that you can do more. Selling yourself that your circumstances and your situation and what you don't have in the bank or where you are does not define you. The easiest thing I could do is get them to speak to you. The most difficult thing that I've ever done, and it took me 14 years to do, this Les Brown that you now see, Mike Williams saw him. I did not see him. Write this down. Have somebody in your life develop a relationship with someone who can see what you can't see. And the reason that most of us can't see our greatness is because you can't see the picture when you're in the frame. You need somebody with you. You need an Angelo Dundee who's in the corner of, of Muhammad Ali who said, I'm the greatest. But every bout that he won a championship, Angelo Dundee was in his corner. Michael Jordan is called one of the greatest basketball players of all time, but he never won a championship until Phil Jackson showed up. Does that make sense to you? There's some people that can pull some stuff out of you that you cannot pull out of yourself. I had a friend to call the other day, one of my top speakers. He's not going toe to toe with me. And even I would say to him that he's better. And he said to me, he said, I had no idea that I could do this. He said, I used to look at you and say, I could never be able to do that. He's gifted. He says, but now I know I'm gifted too. And there are those of you in this room, you've had experiences with people that you've been working with and people that you've coached and, and they've transformed and they cannot believe who they are. One of my favorite quotes, I love it, is by Dr. Howard Thurman Comfort. He was, an admi he was a, 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 a mentor to Mahatma Gandhi and Albert Schweitzer and to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Martin Luther King Sr. said, Howard, I want you to train my boy MLK. Howard wrote, deep is to hunger. The voice of the genuine, the centering moment. He said, the ideal situation for a man or woman to die. Have family members praying with them as they cross over. Fifteen years ago when I had 238 radiation seed implants, when I was first diagnosed with prostate cancer, I was reading these words and they grabbed me. He said, the ideal situation for a man or woman to die. Have family members praying with them as they cross over. He said, but imagine, if you will, being on your deathbed and standing around your bed, the ghost of the dreams, the ideas, the abilities, the talents given to you by life. But you, for whatever reason, you never pursued those dreams. You never acted on those ideas. You never used those gifts. We never heard your voice. And there they are standing around your bed looking at you with large, angry eyes saying, we came to you and only you could have given us life. And now we must die with you forever. And the question is, if you died today, what dreams, what ideas, what gifts, what talents, what books, what voice, what stories will die with you? 
Miles Monroe, great speaker out of Bahamas, said the wealthiest place on the planet is, it's not in the Four East where there's oil in the ground. It's not in South Africa where there are diamond mines. He said the wealthiest place on the planet is the cemetery. Because there you find potential never realized. There you find dreams that never become a reality. There you find voices of leadership that the world never heard from. Maybe that's why one woman wrote in a moment of anguish, what if you live your whole life only to discover that it was wrong? That it was wrong. That you live your whole life playing small. And that God had so much more in store for you. Maybe that's why Henry David Thoreau said, oh God, to reach the point of death only to realize that you've never lived. That you've never scraped the surface of your potential. Let's everybody say together, live full. Live full. Die empty. And so I want to just share with you that I don't know you, but here's what I know about you. Some of you I do know that you've got something special. You've got greatness within you. I, I know, based upon my own experience, that I know you've done things that you feel good about and that you're proud of. But I can tell you, you have so much more in you. You have so much more in you than you can ever begin to imagine. Here's how you get it out. Write this down. Put yourself, in, and you're doing this already, in a perpetual state of preparation and discomfort. Put yourself in a perpetual state of preparation and discomfort. And that's what you're doing here. This is what Secret Knox is about. Because, and write this down, your power is beyond your comfort zone. I didn't do what I'm doing now because... I had to get out of my comfort zone. Mike Williams told me, Les Brown, you can be more than a disc jockey, the man about town, emceeing programs at the Bottoms Up Club and the Pink Pussycat and Jamaica Club, being a morning personality on WVKO radio station in Columbus, Ohio. You can do more than that. How many had somebody see something in you you didn't see in yourself? Raise your hands, please. So I didn't see that. And, and, and it took him 14 years to convince this Les Brown that you now see to come out. And when his daughter, which is my goddaughter, Anika, called me to write the forward to his book, write this down. The Road to Your Best Stuff. Get that book. That's my mentor. If it weren't for this guy, you would not know this, Les Brown. I'd have still been in radio. The Road to Your Best Stuff by Mike Williams. I started crying. She said, why are you crying? I said, because I just, oh my God. That had I not gone to Champion Junior High School in Columbus, Ohio, the day that your father spoke and I was following him around and he said to me, Les Brown, I want to work with you. You can do more than you're now doing. I said, you would not know this voice. Write this down. You have a power voice. You have a power voice. There's another voice in you. I believe in something Gene said. There's no accident that you're in this room. I believe that everything at this stage of my life, and I beat cancer last year for the second time last year this time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Last year this time, I cancer metastasized in eight different areas of my body, ate 40% of my T1 vertebrae, put 50 pounds on me. Then I became type 2 diabetic, could not come to one of the meetings last year. And now, stand before you, my PSA is 0.00. I'm no longer type 2 diabetic. Yeah. And like Frank said, I believe that there's another calling. There's something else that I'm supposed to do. That's why I talk about what my products do and my training. And what I, my goal is to train people on is how to speak to the mind, the heart, and the spirit. And so let, let's go through this. Let me share this with you. Let's go through the next slide, please. Let us say together. Get out of your head. Get out of your head. And into your greatness. Next, please. Greatness. Yes. I'm going to run through these real quick. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You have greatness within you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. Next one. My living legacy, ladies and gentlemen, one of the goals that I'm doing and, and I'm looking for support is to train 100,000 voices of hope outside of politics and outside of religion, both of which I believe polarize and divide people, ordinary people teaching them how to stand in their story and how to be, become a strategic, experiential storyteller. There are people that, that are waiting to hear your voice and that when you speak to them, when you speak, they're going to hear you. When you speak, you'll be able to transform their minds. 
You'll be able to create a thirst within them to expand their skill set so that they'll be able to create and craft a life that they feel good about in this global economy and encourage them to create collaborative achievement, achievement driven relationships. And I believe that we can transform the planet with that. Let's go to the next. What is your story? The way we live our lives is a result of the story that we believe about ourselves. Mr. Washington was an interrupter. That's what you are as a speaker, as a trainer. And I'll never forget this man. I came in his room. He said, young man, go to board and work, right, work this problem out for me. I said, oh, I can't do that, sir. He said, why not? I'm not one of your students. Look at me. Yes, sir. Go to the board and work the problem out anyhow. I can't, sir. And the other students started laughing. He's DT. He's Leslie. His brother is Wesley. He said, what's DT? He's the dumb twin. And as they erupted in laughter, he came from behind his desk when I looked at him and said, I am, sir. He said, don't you ever say that again. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. That was an interruption in my life. He interrupted my script. He looked at me with the eyes of Goethe, who said, look at a man the way that he is, he only becomes worse. But look at him as if he were what he could be, then he becomes what he should be. And so we developed a relationship. Let us say together, interruption. Interruption. Distract. Distract. Yeah, what we do as speakers, and this is how I train speakers, write this down. Three things that we do. Number one, distract, dispute, and inspire. We distract them with our story. That's why it's very important for you to learn how to tell your story and be strategic and experiential. You distract them from their story. Psychologists call this self-explanatory style. He said, young man... Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. My mother said, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. How many of you know words can hurt you? Yeah. They can hurt you very deeply, all right? So what he did, he distracted me. That's what you're doing when you speak, when you tell people your story. And why is it important for you to learn how to tell your story? Because, in fact, that when you speak, when you're presenting, people are asking three questions. Write this down. Who are you? What do you have? And why should I care? We're going to be watching the, the, the debate tonight. You know what people will be looking for? Who is Romney? They want to know that. They're familiar with the president. They want to know who is this guy. When you go in the room and you're talking to somebody one-on-one, small groups, large groups, who are you? What do you have and why should I care? Does that make sense? Okay, now write this down. And I saw when somebody I was working with, they did this last night. I said, whoa. Never let what you want to say get in the way of what your audience needs to hear. Never let what you want to say get in the way of what your audience needs to hear. The person wanted me to work with, I came to see her last night. I'm out talking to people in the audience. She was up there ready to do her presentation. One of the first things I do when I am booked for a client or a corporation what gave me the competitive edge, because I didn't have money, I don't have a college education. When I was in fifth grade, I was labeled educable, mentally retarded, put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade, fail again when I was in the eighth grade, never worked for a major corporation. And I was looking at, my dream was to establish myself as an intellectual resource for corporate America. You saw my client base. Now, what I had to do is find a way to make myself stand out. What I noticed is that most speakers are scripted. They have a memorized script. So I trained myself to... And something that, 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 that the gene had up on, on, the, on the firm. He said, you know, said, build, people talk about building mouse trout. He said, find out the nature of the mouse. Remember that one? Yes. So I never go in to, to speak to somebody until I find out the nature of the people that I'm speaking to. Who are they? What do they have? What does work? What does not work? I do communications intelligence. And so not only to the people who bring me in and I do a needs assessment, but I come early to talk to the people in the audience that I'm asking them, if you were in my position, what, what do you think people need to walk away with that would be of value to them? Those are two different conversations. Am I making sense? And I train myself to speak extemporaneously and create the experience. Write this down. Create the experience. You create the experience for them, and let me tell you why you are so important now than ever before. Bill Gates said the retraining of Americans will be the biggest budget in this century. So let me show you something. Let's, run through, let's go through the slides right quick. Boom, next one, please. Go to the next one, please. I'm going to run through some stuff right quick. Go ahead. Go to the next one, please. Learn how to tell your story next. Now, right there, you have an energy signature. You, there, there's, there's an experience that you can create that technology and cheap labor abroad can't touch. 
That makes your life recession proof. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, I'm recession proof. Yeah. I'm recession Yeah. 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 I, this, this experience right now cannot be created by a computer or technology or cheap labor abroad. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, you have, an, you have an energy signature. Once you learn how to create that with your story, there will always be room for you. What, what, what crises for the masses is an opportunity for an individual who knows how to tell their story and know how to use their energy signature. Am I making sense on that? Yes. Go ahead. Good, good. Now, you've seen a lot of speakers, but they, they, you're already doing this, building key relationships. Next, please. If your dream is different than the story you believe about yourself, you will always manifest your story. As I'm speaking to you right now, I'm interrupting your script. Some of you are stepping outside of the script of the story you've been written into, and you're ready to play a bigger game. Who's ready to play a bigger game? Raise your hands. Very good. How much time do I have, please? I'm going to be on time. Give me time. Yes. Yeah. If you just give me 15 more minutes, I'll run through this right quick. All right? Let's give me 15 more. I'll run through this right quick. Now, develop the mindset of a successful entrepreneur. We'll skip those seven principles. Go ahead. Go ahead next. Oh, storytelling, storytelling, write this down. R email me at yes at lesbrown.com and I'm going to send you seven strategies for being an effective storyteller. How many of you like to learn how to do that? Show you what I do, get you in my head, all right? Just email me at yes at lesbrown, put in there that secret knock and I'll, I'll, we will send that out to you. Next, please. Also, next, go forward, please. Also, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to send you, a, 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 I'm going to send you some that you will give them some, I'm going to send this to you, Greg, and then you send it out to them. You will see, I'm going to send you some, some, some videos of students that have worked it, and you see how they craft their story, and you see how, and whatever your business is, how do you can, you see examples of it, how you can use your story to influence and impact an audience in any kind of setting, and gives you the versatility to do that. Let us say together, I live, I live. a cause-centered life. See, this, this, is, this, this started out small in Greg's living room, but it's bigger than Greg and Ali now. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah how many of you want to live a cost in life? Raise your hands. Absolutely. You know, we want to make some money, but how many of you want to leave a mark, please? Yeah. I read this article, The Case for Optimism. Regardless of your political persuasion, when I look at you and come in this room, and I look at Secret Knock, and I look at Greg and Ali, when I look at Coach, y'all don't know Coach, but that's my homie, when I look at him... <laughs> Okay, it's a case for optimism. When I see Coach smile, it's a case for optimism. Can't be cynical. We have created a generation of cynics and critics. There's never been a statue erected to a critic. Just, there's never been a statue erected to a critic. Just imagine if when, when President Barack Obama, regardless of your political persuasion, had gotten elected, what if the, the Republicans had said, we're going to work together to create a new world, as opposed to our number one agenda is to defeat him. Come on. You can't build and tear down at the same time. That's a whole different other mindset. The, the reason that we're here about Secret Knox is because we have a person who has a sense of optimism that all of us share, that all of us can do better, all of us can have more, all of us can create more and leave a mark. And not just marking on our bodies, but making a mark with our life. You're getting a mark on your body, you sit down and let somebody do that. That's no biggie. You have to stand up and get engaged in life to do something beyond that. Next one, please. But that's worth reading. It's very interesting. Let us say together, I choose to live, I choose to live. my greatest life now. How many of you speak for corporations right now? Raise your hands, please. <coughs> very few who, okay, I'm gonna show you how you can get to just using something very basic and simple and get to earning, and I'll tell you what I know, earning $25,000 an hour. How many like to do that? Raise your hands, please. Good, how many like to earn $125,000 when you speak outside the state, all right? Good, I'm gonna bring you into my world. This is what I do. Okay, now let's go to the next one. Notice how I started off. I start off with my story. I said I was born in an abandoned building with a twin brother. Remember I said that? And we were adopted. What does that have to do with IBM or Xerox or the Million Dollar Roundtable or Remax? 
What does that have to do with corporations? Nothing. Am I right? How many of you got a story? Now, you don't even have to have a story. How many of you ever heard of Mary Ann Williams? Raise your hand, please. Mary Ann Williams wrote a story about a book. She wrote a book about a book, A Course in Miracles. According to A Course in Miracles. Am I right? I'm not making this up. All right? Now, here's what happened. What I did, I went from my, I'll write this down, create a bridge. How many of you know that there are a lot of people that are not happy right now? Raise your hands. Let me share with you a friend of mine. Um, that, that he was going through that same kind of experience. And you know when people decide to do something with their lives? When they decide, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. My friend, he was tired of losing. He wanted to win in life. And the way that his life was at that point in time, it wasn't giving him what he wanted. How many of you have ever been there? Raise your hands, please. Write this down, accountability. He held himself accountable. He decided, I'm going to do something to improve my situation. Jim Rohn said something. He said, we don't get paid by the hour. We get paid for the value we bring to the hour. And so what he did was he held himself accountable and he made a decision to do something different with his life. How many of you decided to do that? Raise your hands, please. And here's something else that you did. Write this down. Nurturing relationships. He, re he reached out to a friend of mine named Jay. And Jay is his Coach, see, one of the important things about making it in life, you've got to have some nurturing relationships, relationships that bring the best out of you. There are two types of relationships, toxic relationships and nourishing relationships. Toxic relationships, they bring you down. Toxic relationships, they point out all of your shortcomings. Toxic relationships, they remind you of mistakes. But nurturing relationships, they bring the best out of you. Nurturing relationships, they hold you higher to a higher standard. And so... Anthony, Anthony reached out and got a coach because he knew he didn't know and he wanted to learn from someone who was involved in helping people to change their lives. And he said, would you help me? Write this down. Ask for help, not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong. And so Anthony reached out to Jay. A lot of people won't do that because of pride. Pride cometh before fall because of ego. Ego means edging God out. Okay, next thing is T, total commitment. That one of the things that as I looked at him and saw his eyes and I saw him out front and I grabbed him, embraced him, and we spoke briefly on the telephone, he sold out. He's made a total commitment. When you're ready to, to change your life, 99 and a half won't do it. You know, you can't be involved in changing your life. The difference between involvement and commitment, the chicken was involved, the pig was committed. He had to give it all up. And so Anthony's willing to give up the places he used to go. He's willing to give up the things he used to do. He's willing to give up the people he used to hang around because he knows that won't help him. How many have done that? Raise your hands, please. Good. Write this down. Higher standards. That in, in Anthony's vision of himself, in his own sense of self-worth, he has raised the bar. He's, out of the, he's operating out of the thinking of Henry David Thoreau, who said, do not go where the path may lead, but go where there's no path and leave a trail. Do you see what I'm doing with just that little bit of his story? Have you see how I weaved him into the story? Can you not do that in any kind of setting? Anthony, I can't wait to get through with you. Trust me. <laughs> On this, Don't come around me if, you, if you're not ready to be stretched because I'm an assassin. I'll kill every mediocre demon in you. All right. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I'll take him out. Let me tell you something. Don't, don't you let this 68 fool you. You know, young broom sweep clean, as Gina tell you, but old broom nowhere to go. <laughs> so, so this is my mother, Mamie Brown. This is my mother. And, and then, well, you just saw her. That's Weston and I, you eating sugar cane. Anybody here ever eat sugar cane? Very good. Next slide, please. Now, 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 Donald Trump's father gave him $200 million. How many of you know if someone gives you $200 million, you got a good shot at living your dream? Raise your hand. Huh? <laughs> My mama gave us two pieces of sugar cane. <laughs> and we still had an advantage. Room always get quiet and I say that. If you had a choice, Donald Trump was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. If you had a choice between eating a silver spoon or eating sugar cane, which one would you eat? Sugar cane. I told you we had an advantage. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's go to the next one here. 
So this guy, let us say together, interruption. interruption. This guy, Mike Williams, who wrote The Road to Your Best Stuff, he saw me one day walking down the halls of WVKO in Columbus, Ohio, with a big afro and a daishiki and jeans and tennis shoes. And he said, Les Brown, you can do more than be a disc jockey. I was Les Brown, the man about town in Columbus, Ohio, during the Woody Hayes days. And he spoke to me between records. Look out, here comes Aretha Franklin, a new record called Respect. Come on, Riri, sock it to me, sock it to me, sock it to me. Wilson Pickett turning on his soul spigot. Come on, Pickett, and kick it. This is Les Brown, your man about town. Get up, baby, this morning. All right? <laughs> So he said, you can do more than that. Next slide. He said, you can do more than that. And so I then, he expanded my vision of myself. How many of you had some people to expand your vision of what was possible for him? That's what he did. And so he expanded my vision. I became a promoter. Next one, please. And I brought some guys to town, these little guys out of Indiana, brought them to town to book them, 1973. I weighed 174 pounds at that time. He didn't know, they didn't know who I was, and I didn't know who they were. When I had you to shake someone's hand around the table and say, you have something special, you have greatness within you, you have no idea whose hand you just shook. <laughs> Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered the heart of mankind, what that person is going to become whose hand you just shook, whose pulse you just felt. Had no idea. Next slide, please. I had no idea. That boy was 10 years old when I saw him. Became one of the greatest entertainers of all times. We have something special. How many like to make a difference in your community? Raise your hands, please. Good. We work with people to, to learn how to begin to reach beyond their comfort zone. I was a community commentator because of Mike Williams. I became actively involved in the community, leading demonstrations of 10 to 15,000 people. Being in that studio was not enough. How many of you got a job? Raise your hands, please. How many work on a job? Good. The reason you're here is because you're not mentally fit to work for somebody for the rest of your life. <laughs> Being on a job is not enough for you. And that's why you're here, and you're in the right place. And so I wanted to do so. I wanted to make a difference in the community. How many like to make a difference in your community? That's what I wanted to do. And so next slide. And so I wanted to, to, to make my voice heard beyond entertaining people. Notice the difference in the disc jockey. You saw the disc jockey? And then the community activist. Notice this distant evolution. There are other individuals in the chair where you're now seated. And this guy here, raising my hand, I was elected to the Ohio legislature. And I, I was the chairman of the Human Resource Committee. I was elected three terms. Didn't have the money. Don't worry if you don't have the money. Didn't have the money for this. Didn't have the contact. Didn't have the experience. An angel like Greg Reed came to my life named Horace Perkins when I was fired for editorializing about police brutality. And he said, Les Brown, people love you. Man, here, I've got these petition signs. Sign your name here. You ought to run for state representative. I said, I don't know anything about politics. He said, neither do the people who run. <laughs> he said, you are the person who touched a lot of people's lives in this community. I said, but he's endorsed by the party. He, he's got more money than I have. I don't have anything. I'm out of a job. I can't even get a job in Columbus, Ohio. They blackball me. He said, Les, but people remember how you made them feel. I ran for office. I had a saying when I was on the air, stand up for what you believe in because you can fall for anything. I had $650. My opponent had over $50,000 endorsed by organized labor, both local newspapers, including the African-American newspaper. So I came to the radio station to Perkins. He said, what do you have, Brown? I said, $650. He says, Brown, today is Friday. The election is Tuesday. He says, do what you always do when you worked here. I said, what? He said, figure out how you're going to overcome the odds. You've always done that, Brown. I went in the middle room. I sat there for five minutes. I said, OK, Perkins, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I said, will Bert Charles allow me to use the pr production room? He said, yes. I went in the production room. I called my mama. I said, mama? Yes, Leslie. I said, I want you to say something for me. I'm about to run for state representative. She said, boy, what is that? <laughs> It, it, it's, don't worry about it. I just need you to say something to have people come out and vote for me, Mama. I'm too self-conscious to do it myself. She said, I ain't got time for that. I said, Mama, I'll give you $200. My mother loved money. She said, when are you going to give me my money, boy? <laughs> I said, I'll give it to you as soon as you do this for me. 
I said, but don't talk long. Just say what you feel, Mama. She said, okay. I said, all right, do it now, Mama. She said, hello, this is Mamie Brown. When I raised my boys, I raised them to be good boys. When they got out of hand, I beat their behinds. Please vote for my son. He's a good boy. Usually in the state representative race, they get about 3,000 votes. I got 26,000 votes. I beat an incumbent, a 22-year incumbent, in a district that was 65% white. Four attorneys ran against, huh? Oh, yes, I sent her $400, see ya. <laughs> yes, so next slide, please. I love politics, I love my mother. I went to Miami to take care of my mother. Write this down, create strategic partnerships. You're doing that already, you had to write that down. Write this down, borrowed credibility. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale was the top man when, when I was coming up. I admired him. He spoke from his diaphragm. He spoke and he gave me goose pimples. I remember when I first went to meet him, like you and I met today, Anthony. I was backstage and when his wife opened the door, Martha, she said, you're not Les Brown, the man about the, 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 the band now. And I said, no. She said, who are you? I said, I'm Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. And so she said, Pops, she said, he's here. Les Brown, who's going to open for you, but it's not the band leader. So his back was to me. He said, Les Brown, Les Brown, shoot for the moon, because even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. I said, sir, that's my quote. I sent that to you when I was in the 10th grade. He said, Mr. Brown, every time I speak, I close my speech out with that quote. You see it on bookmarkers and on posters. I sent that to him. Shoot for the moon. You'll land among the stars. Next, please. And so I resigned from the Ohio legislature. I went back to take care of my mother. I gave up my political ambitions. I was going to run for the Senate, then Congress, and Lieutenant Governor to take care of Mama. Mama was a 22-year breast cancer conqueror. That's my baby. Whenever I speak, I can feel her presence with me. God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of that woman that you're looking at right now. My brothers and sisters wanted to put her in a nursing home. Les, we got a good nursing home for her. Let me tell you something. She didn't wipe their behinds. She wiped our behinds. How could one woman raise seven children who couldn't take care of themselves, but seven grown people couldn't take care of one woman? I had a problem with that, all right? Yeah, sure, yeah. How many of you have had something happen to you in life that put your dreams on hold? Raise your hands, please. Yes, yes. So that happened for my, my mother, but that's my baby. Next, please. And so, but, where's what happened? What Mike Williams did was, let us say, drip. Say drip, please. Drip, drip, drip. He kept dripping on me. And what he did was, I realized it was, now, and this is, I felt that I didn't know enough. Write this down. It's not what you don't know, it's what you think you need that keeps you from playing a bigger game. I didn't think I was enough. Gene said it. You are enough. Everything you need, you have it in you right now. The biggest challenge is to come to a place and it's an ongoing awakening process. We read where God put man to sleep. We never read where he woke him up. It's a gradual process. Awareness as we become more aware, we become aware of who we are and it shows up in our, our, our behavior. That's a PBS special that I did. did over. How many of you have college education? Raise your hands, please. Very good. How many of you have ever given a lecture at Harvard? Raise your hands, please. Good. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, that's in your future. That's in your future. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left. That's in your yeah. future. That's in your future. That's, you. Yes. Right here. Everybody point at me right now. Everybody point at me right now. Everybody point at me right now. Say, Les Brown. Les Brown. If you can do it. If you do it. I can do it. I can do it. This time when you come back and say, I said with more power. Ready? Do it again. Les Brown. Les if you can do it, I can do it. Absolutely, yes, it is. and you will. Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto you. Next, please. And so I won the highest award from the National Speakers Association. Didn't do this for 14 years. Next, please. How many ever heard of Toastmasters? Won the highest award from Toastmasters, a Golden Gavel Award. Didn't have any idea. Didn't do this for 14 years. You know why? Because it was hard. 
But in order to reach your goals and live your dream, you got to make a radical change in who you are. How many of you decide not to do something because it was hard? Raise your hands. Be honest. Now. Raise your hand. Write this down. If you do what is easy, that's coming up with excuses, giving yourself a pass. If you do what is easy, your life will be hard. But if you do what is hard, your life will be easy. Does that make sense? And so it took him 14 years to convince me to make the hard decision to make a radical change in myself, to die to who I was, to give birth to who I could become. That's why I'm an assassin. Some of you are dying to who you are right now and ready to play a bigger game. Next one, please. Now, this is funny. 14 years it took him to convince me you got a voice. 14 years. They selected Toastmasters, the top five speakers in the world. General Norman Schwarzkopf, who ever heard of him? Raise your hands, please. Leo Coco, raise your hand, you ever heard of him? Robert Schuller, raise your hand, you ever heard of him? Paul Harvey, you ever, you ever heard of him? And see that guy in the center right there? Some of y'all need to go out and get some sugar cane. Next slide, please. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Shake someone stand on your right and left as you look at that picture and say, I gotta play a bigger game. I gotta play a bigger game. <laughs> I got to play a big game. I got to play a bigger game. I got to play a bigger game. I got to play a bigger game. Am I making sense on you? I got to play a bigger game. I'm shocked. Now, these are people that we're going to run this. This is Darren Benzie. He helped to develop DirecTV, billion-dollar corporation. Uh, this is Sean Arnold. Slow down just a bit. <laughs> Sean, but Darren, he's not working with us. He's been listening to me since he was 11 years old. There are certain people who are going to hear your voice. They hear me in their ears, but they will feel you in their heart and their spirit. That's why I'm training these 100,000 voices. Of hope. He heard me when he was 11 years old. His father died when he was very young. He's an attorney. He was the attorney for Rupert Murdoch, and we worked together. He's an incredible young man. Next, please. He found me. Sean Arnold was working. She's an attorney. And Sean, we worked together last night. She had a great night. Sean earned $4,000 last night. She was no longer billable hours. She's living her dream, changing lives. She was in foster care here in California. We are both advocates for kids in foster care to give them a voice. Go next one, please. Alan McDougall. Alan McDougall was a coal miner, an introvert out of Pennsylvania, used to be an alcoholic. I'll show you about your voice. It can change lives, can save lives. The guy who saved his life from alcoholism was in a bar drunk, and he paid a guy $50 to kill him, to run him over. He drank a few other drinks and went and laid in the street with the empty bottle on his chest, which was as empty as his life. He tensed himself when he heard a car coming. And then all of a sudden, the car stopped, door opened. He heard the footsteps. The guy said, what are you doing? He said, I'm waiting to die. He said, what are you doing later on tonight? He said, I wasn't planning on being here. <laughs> he said, let me help you out. Where are you staying? At a hotel down the street. He said, good, I'll come see you at 12 midnight and I'll bring some drinks. Guy said, yes. Guy was an alcoholic. He thought he was going to bring him some drinks. And this guy showed up with two cups of coffee and had a conversation with him and gave him a CD, a cassette tape called It's Not Over Till I Win by me. And that guy life changed that night, and that guy saved Alan McDougall, who's now the national spokesperson for Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. Oh, wow. Isn't that something? Yes. Yeah. Next, please. This young lady heard me speak. She was a teacher. 2,000 people, but she felt, as Mr. Washington spoke, I was talking to her. And so Annie, you can go to Dive Into Your Imagination, go to her website, Annie she resigned from teaching that people that when you speak, you're going to change their lives. When they hear your voice, their lives will never be the same again. They'll leave your presence feeling better about themselves, but talking about you because of your story. Annie sold everything she had because her passion was doing videography under the water. She's on some island and they were videotaping 
um, hammerhead shark. She emailed me, Les, come on down. I emailed her back and said, have you ever heard of a black person being eaten by a hammerhead shark? We don't do that. We don't do that kind of stuff. Freeze to death on Mount Everest. We don't do that. Sharks don't eat black people because we don't go where they are. <laughs> I'm serious. You never heard of a black person that said, oh, I got bit by a shark, homie. Yeah, that's a no. We, that ain't us. <laughs> Next, please. Next. <laughs> Take back your power, Trish. Luan, I'm, I'm training Latino speakers and Asian speakers, uh, Ming Wong and others. Go to the next one, please. So my goal is, this is he, you ever heard of Fiji Water? He was the chief operating officer for Fiji Water. Did a major project for him, brought it in under time, made a a lot of money for him, and then they let him go, say, we're going in another direction. So now he's the leadership, he's the voice of leadership. Clifton Anderson, go to his website. Incredible voice, incredible voice. This guy, Johnny Wimbry. Johnny lives in Dallas, Texas. His best friend was killed in a game. Johnny's in and out of juvenile detention center, in and out of prison. He's an ex-felon. So he was in church ready to avenge his, his best friend's death with a gun in his pocket. After his, the, his best friend's mother left the church, the reporters came up and ambushed and said, what do you have to say about your son's death? And she said, I forgive the young man who killed my son. Johnny's standing there angry, and her words just dispel his anger. He said, I loved him, but I didn't love him as much as his mother. He went back into church, gave the minister his gun, the minister said, here's a number. I want you to call this guy. His name is Les Brown. You've got a lot of energy. You've been using it destructively. He can help you use it constructively. Johnny called me. He's been, I've been working with him for seven years. He wrote a book called From the Hood to Doing Good. Just got back from Israel. What perhaps one of the most electrifying um, speakers I've ever trained. Next, please. So, how many of you like quotes? Raise your hands. I love quotes. Good. Email me at yes at lesbrown.com. We'll send you some. Yes at lesbrown.com. Next, next, please. We'll send you my favorites. And also, my goal is passing out po positive words on the planet. And so if you go to my Facebook, brown.less, every day we have about two or three messages there. And then the proof is in the pudding. Just read what people are saying about those posts that we have up there. And you can follow us on Twitter as you will. I'm going to tell you my story. Let us say together, you got to be hungry. Say it again, you got to be hungry. This one story has carried me for 40 years. Mr. Washington said, Mr. Brown, what do you want to do with your life, young man? Sir, I want to take care of my mother. How do you plan to do that? I said, um, I want to become a disc jockey. He said, you got to be hungry. I said, what do you mean by that? People that are hungry are willing to do the things today others won't do. In order to have the things tomorrow, others won't have. You're showing up here at Secret Knock in a so-called tough economy. Some of you couldn't afford to be here, but you also felt, given the quality and the relationships and what happens here, that you couldn't afford not to be here. Because you're hungry for a new life. There's something in you that says, I want to play a bigger game. There's something in you that says, there's got to be more. You're not willing to settle. And so you've put yourself in an environment that's uncomfortable. You put yourself in an environment that will stretch you and expand your mind about what's possible. And so he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to become a disc jockey, sir. He said, it's good. He said, I want you to listen to Earl Nightingale, the strangest secret in the world. Listen to this over and over and over again. I listened to it. He said, continue to listen until you're producing the results. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. And then here are my car keys. I want you to go to my car at lunchtime. I said, why? I want you to listen to Paul Harvey. Why? He's the world's greatest communicator. He does a program called The Rest of the Story. Mr. Brown, you want to be successful? I said, yes, sir. Once you open your mouth, young man, you tell the world who you are. Learn how to tell your story and other people's story. Sit in my car at lunchtime. Most people won't do that. I will, sir. I will, sir. And so... I did that, and he shared a variety of things with me. And so in limited time, I want you to know that you have something special. You have greatness within you. You have to have a mindset that I'm going to access my greatness, and that's why you're here. And so I went to WMBM radio station, and Mr. Washington told me he gave me all he can give me, and he'd worked on me and worked on my mind and worked on my communication skills. WMBM radio station was the radio station on Miami Beach. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I'd like to be a disc jockey. Young man, you have any journalism in your background? 
No, sir, I don't. Have any experience in broadcasting? No, sir, but I'm good, sir. I visualize every day. Just let me audition for you. Just give me a shot. I came back the next day. Hello, Mr. Butterball. How are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. He said, I know what your name is. Weren't you here the last two days? I said, yes, sir. Didn't I tell you no the last two days? I said, yes, sir. He said, then why are you back today? I said, well, sir, I know whether or not someone got sick or someone died, sir. No one got sick or died. No one was laid off or fired. Now, don't you come back here again. I came back the next day. Talking loud, looking happy, like I was singing for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Vodafone, how are you? He looked at me with rage. He said, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> my favorite book says, my favorite book says, the greatest among you will be your servant. How many of you are serious about reaching your goals? Raise your hands. Yes. Good, write this down. Provide more service than you get paid for. Day is gone where you can say, well, this is not in my job description. Make yourself stand out. Provide more service than you get paid for. Make yourself stand out in a special way. So I became the errand boy for the disc jockeys. I go get their lunch and their dinner, knowing my time will come. Let us say together, I expect to win. Expect On the weekend, they would come out to the parking lot. Their cars would be clean inside out. Who did this? I did, sir. What do you charge, young man? Nothing, sir. Just want to help out. Write this down, give before you ask. Give before you ask, give service. I just want to get my foot in the door. I just wanted them to see who I was and how I show up in the world and what I do. Judge a tree by the fruit it bears. So they said, look here, Donna Ross and the Supremes are coming to town, the Four Tops and the Temptations. Here are my car keys, pick them up and take them to the Fountain Blue Hotel on Miami Beach. Be my pleasure to serve you, sir. I would drive the disc jockeys, big long Cadillacs all over Miami Beach with those entertainers. Didn't have any driver's license, but I was driving like a hand so. <laughs> then one day, it was a Saturday afternoon, a disc jockey by the name of Rockin' Roger was drinking while he was on the air. Rockin' Roger got so drunk, he could not complete the show. It's a Saturday afternoon, he was slurring his words. It's a Saturday afternoon, he's about to fall off the chair. And I was walking back and forth, looking at him. <laughs> Young, ready, and hungry. I was saying, drink, rock, drink. <laughs> drink, rock. I was going to get him some more if he'd asked me to. Then pretty soon the phone rang. It was the general manager and answered the phone. I said, hello. He said, young boy, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call one of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be think I'm crazy. I called my mom and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all come out on the front porch, turn up the radio. I'm about to come on the air. I waited about 20 minutes. I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and segue the records, but don't you say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I put on a fast record. I said, look out. This is me, LB, Triple P, Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me, and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love Domingo, certified, bona fide, doubly qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby. I'm your love man. I was hungry. Give the old man a round of applause. <laughs> Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, you got to be hungry. Do that right quick. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, you got to be hungry. So, now, so anyhow, I want to say that you're here because you're hungry. There's something in you, Howard Thurman, come forth. There's something in each and every one of you that waits and listens to the voice of the genuine in yourself. It will be perhaps the only guide you will ever have. And if you cannot hear it, all of your life, your days will be spent on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. And the reason that you're here is because you are going to pull your own strings. The reason that you're here, 
There's something about you that knows this is not it for me. I want to play a bigger game. The reason that you're here is because you are not willing to settle. The reason that you're here, that being in this energy and around people that are pursuing their greatness, the secret knock is a knock at your heart that says it's time to break out and play a bigger game. I want to leave this with you. My mother used to love this, and I dedicate this to you and the dreamer in you. Leslie, say that thing for me, boy, that makes me feel good. It says simply this, if you want a thing bad enough to go out and fight for it, to work day and night for it, to give up your time, your peace, and your sleep for it, if all that you dream and scheme is about it, and life seems useless and worthless without it, and if you gladly sweat for it and fret for it and plan for it, and lose all your terror of the opposition for it, and if you simply go after that thing that you want with all of your capacity, strength and sagacity, faith, hope, and confidence, and stern pertinacity, if neither cold, poverty, famish, or gold, sickness or pain of body and brain can keep you away from the thing that you want. If dogged and grim, you besiege and beset it with the help of God, you'll get it. This has been Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy and Greg and Allie's pride and joy. And Coach says, God bless you, God bless your dream, and God bless America. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.